Okay. All righty. You know, you'd think after two years, I figured out how to do Zoom. And forget it. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> welcome all. I hope you are all safe, healthy, and reasonably happy. In the oh, Let me just say, the new normal ain't normal. Okay, moving on. Uh, is there uh, anyone from the public on the call? No one, Frank. No, okay. Then moving on. Uh, I assume everyone's had a chance to uh, review the minutes from the November 18th meeting. And uh, if you've all reviewed it and have no comments, uh, I'd like a motion to approve it. I move. Okay. To approve. A second. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. Aye. Aye. Good. Aye. Okay. Meetings are approved. This is where I'm going to say as little as possible until the end of the meeting. So, first up is Chris Monroe. All right. So, um, Frank, Chris Monroe had, had left me a message saying that he was stuck in some traffic and oh. was uh, kind enough to say, hey, instead of him calling in, and being distracted, it would be better to try to flip the order. So instead of medical being number one, um, okay. would it be possible to have property casualty be number one uh, and then medical can follow up as number two on the agenda? Okay. So <clears throat> go for it. Thank you, appreciate it. Um, and then, so Chris will join, we'll see his face or whatever afterwards. Um, so a connecting to our November session and connecting to past years, uh, one time per year, usually December, January timeframe, uh, it's a great opportunity for the committee to learn more about what's happening with uh, KERMA, you know, it's risk management partner, agency, carrier, kind of all mixed together. Obviously, you know Ashley Rita and you know some other members. Ian Havens has been on these calls before and, and there were members of the town and the school district that like Matt uh, Kazaka definitely know Pat Lipke. Um, so with that in mind, what we wanted to do is uh, really turn the, turn the mic over to Ashley and team to talk about, you know, like the state of Kerma, how's Kerma doing? Uh, any new and different products or services? What are they seeing? Uh, and it kind of talk about what's happening there to give the committee um, a current view and in a forward thinking view, um, knowing that Kerm is an important partner to the town and the school district. So with that in mind, I'd like to turn it over to Ashley Rita. Thank you very much, Chris. Good evening, everyone. Good to see you. Hope you all had good holidays. That it's not in person, um, but November was a treat. I'm just going to go around quickly and let the rest of the team introduce themselves, and then we'll jump into, you know, our, our 2020 to 21 financials and our 21 renewal year, how we did. Um, so, Sherry, you're next in line, so we'll we'll go to you next. So, good evening, everybody. It's Sherry Adams. I'm a liability uh, auto property manager for Kerma. Ian? Hey everyone, it's nice to see everyone again. Uh, my name is Ian Havens, for those of you who don't know me. I am the supervisor of risk management services. As Chris uh, mentioned, this is probably my fourth or fifth time uh, in front of the group. Uh, happy to be here and thanks for continuing to invite me back. Uh, someone else came on, so my windows have shuffled. Cynthia, yep. <laughs> Hi. Good evening, everyone. Um, this is actually my first Southern Field Insurance Committee, so thank you for having me. Happy to be part of it. Um, I am a, also a liability auto and property claims manager with Kerma. And last but not least, Pat. Oh, you're on mute, Pat. Okay, I think I, can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. I'm Pat Whitney. I'm the Senior Workers' Compensation Claims Representative. I handle the Town and Board of Ed Workers' Compensation Claims. All right. So I bear with me because I do have a slideshow, but it takes up both my screens, so I may not use it. Um, but what we usually like to do 
is give a overall summary, an overall summary. Can everyone see my screen? Excellent, excellent. Yes. Um, just sort of an overall summary, like I said, of, of where we are, how we're doing. So this slide represents our 21-22 policy renewal year. We had 99% retention, um, and for the 10th year in a row, we were able to achieve 98% or better. Um, so, it's, you know, it's, it's a good mark and a long streak, and we're happy to be able to keep that running. In those retention numbers, we did lose two workers comp members um, that totaled about 1.6 million in premium, but we did write two new members that were both liability auto property and workers compensation members. Um, and that totaled about 3 million. So, you know, even though we're losing members, we're still able to grow the book and, and keep the pool at, you know, at an area where, where we want it to be. Um, both of the new members actually came from, and Alex, I'm going to apologize in advance, from Travelers. Um, and one of the reasons they cited was uh, Kerma stability and premium over the years. So if I can figure out how to go to the next slide, that sort of brings us to our year end results for fiscal year 2020 to 21. We had 224 million in member surplus, which is up about $40 million from last year. The majority of that um, came from investment income. We did see better underwriting loss results driven largely by the workers' compensation. Um, probably due to COVID, um, but it's obviously still a big question mark for us. So we're continuing to be conservative, um, you know, but we still performed really well with, um, you know, our financials and our stability. We um, were able to keep over the past 10 years, our workers comp average has been and uh, on average, negative 1.2%, and our lap 10 year average has been 0.2%. So the average movement on our rate need for both pools has been plus or minus 5% over the, the past 15 years. Um, again, so that just sort of speaks to the financial strength and the stability that PERMA prides itself on. Any questions thus far, comments? Anyone on my team want to jump in? No? All right. Um, one of the other positive things about Perma and its financial strength, obviously, is our member equity distribution, which we have talked about at more than one meeting. Um, over the last 11 years, Perma has returned $37 million in member equity. Um, this past equity, um, we were at, I think, 3% of our total premium. Um, but the last one that we just did that we sent checks out, we're back up to that 5% range, which is really great where we want to be. <clears throat> We still continue to partner with AMBAS, A or better rated carriers for our reinsurance partners, our ancillary lines of business. Um, that also goes into our active assailant and cyber coverages that we can help place. Um, obviously with USI and Chris, you are in good hands and I know working on that. So I'm going to not go into, I'll, I'll try my hardest not to go into cyber in this meeting. Um, but those were really the, the high point. We continue to provide coverage for sexual abuse and molestation, which is obviously a very hot topic. Um, we're in the process of having our 2022 reinsurance renewal discussions already, which I'm not ready for. I can't even, I haven't even gotten into the habit of writing 2022 yet. I'm still writing 2021. So hopefully I'll catch up soon. Uh, but like I said, you know, unless anyone has any questions or comments, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen.
Ashley, um, <clears throat> it's great, great information there. Um, I didn't know if uh, either Sherry or, or maybe Ian Havens had any comments about what they're seeing uh, in terms of maybe some major claim trends with the members of Kerma, so the towns and the school districts that are similar in profile to Weathersfield, and may, you know if there's like a one or two major claim trends that they are seeing that they think in this next year, the town or the school district might have that could help with a focus on a going forward basis for for Mike, for uh, Matt, for Claudia, uh, et cetera. Any, any additional comments there? I do have a, a couple of things that I did wanna um, bring up. I will uh, caveat it by saying it's not gonna be driven by the claims numbers. So if Sherry, if you do have anything specific to the claims numbers, I'll kind of defer that uh, to anyone else on the team. But um, really at these meetings, when I attend them, I try to go over holistically some things that were coming up from risk management over either the past year, going into the new year. Um, one thing that I do want to make a, a comment for this past year is I thought that uh, me and Claudia really became best friends um, in HR, and uh, it led to a lot of successes. Number one being conducting ergonomics ass assessments at the library for a number of the staff members there, and, and we really did an analysis on the type of work that was being done, looking at the work stations and being able to adjust those accordingly so as to mitigate from workers' compensation claims. I thought that was a really great exercise that we did. We also did a workers' comp assessment where we looked at the entire workers' compensation program, and she was really integral in, in allowing me to, to better understand what that program was for Weathersfield. Uh, that's good for the workers' comp side. On the employment practices side of things, um, I was able to share that Kerma does have an employment practices liability helpline that we offer to our members at no additional cost. And it's actually run through a law firm, Rose Kaler LLP. And what that program does is it, it allows one free hour per month to, <laughs> uh, exactly here, thank you, Ashley, to all, um, excuse me, Kerma LAP members, where if there's an employment decision or you're thinking about making a decision, give these people a call and they may be an extra set of eyes and ears uh, to assist with that. So I really think that was successful. Um, and I know it has been used uh, sporadically over the past year, which was great. That's where we were. Happy to answer any questions on that, but I do wanna spend some time on uh, where we're going. Um, one of those areas being I've talked a lot about training at this meeting, specifically expanding on our online training options. We've offered online training for seven plus years. It started really with three courses being offered in the area of OSHA compliance, bloodborne pathogens, hazard communication, and it's really been successful and it has grown over the years. This past year, we actually switched our vendor for the first time ever. We went from the Lexapol system to now we are with Target Solutions, who now offers two catalogs for us to offer training through. They offer the, the Vector Solutions catalog, which is specific to general government, police, fire, and a lot of uh, HR, OSHA compliance areas that may fall for uh, the general government town side of things. But what's really cool is for the first time ever, we actually have a dedicated catalog specific to mm -hmm. Uh, public schools. So we are offering now a scenario learning is what they call it or safe schools catalog specific to public school risk management and training. Uh, so working with students who may be on the autism spectrum or behavioral management, other things related to teachers and paraprofessionals, custodians, we've never really offered specific trainings to those individuals who really make up half of our book of business at Kerma. So starting on January 1 of 2022, we now offer this robust system, which will allow us to uh, document better, which will allow members such as the town or the school district to record even trainings that happen outside of the platform. They'll be able to put those records into this system. And it really is a good document management system. So we've expanded a lot of our functionality in our e-learning system. Uh, over the past really couple, six or so months, we were doing the transition over and now it's uh, fully up and running. 
Uh, I also wanted to talk about three other topics, which I think are follow-ups to what we talked about last year. Uh, one of them being uh, vaccinations and vaccination mandates for COVID. Uh, when those executive orders were being rolled through throughout this past year, we worked very closely with our legal uh, advisors who were able to offer trainings, webinar trainings specific to the different uh, executive orders that were being rolled out. So we're offering pretty much real time legal expertise on a number of those executive orders, which we would offer live and then make available on our webinar library. We're gonna continue doing that as uh, I think it was uh, Chairperson Cena uh, mentioned how this is really the new normal, the new abnormal, if you like the Strokes who uh, uh, had a nice album called the new abnormal, but um, things are constantly changing and we can't always uh, be a necessarily ahead of whatever that new executive order is going to be. But once that executive order hits or that law changes or that new guidance comes through from the CDC or DPH, what we are trying to do is provide as much information as we possibly can, as quickly as we possibly can to our members. And webinars have allowed us to do that as people aren't able to get in uh, to trainings in one room. So uh, those are gonna continue to happen as new things get rolled out. Uh, we also last year, I believe, talked about the Police Accountability Bill, which is now the Police Accountability Act. Throughout 2021, we offered a number of virtual trainings on use of force. Uh, if For any of you who have read through that bill, there were some training requirements that came out of that bill. And uh, we partnered with uh, Attorney Elliot Spector, who does a lot of work with us and, and for our members uh, from the legal side of things on uh, law enforcement liability. So uh, attorney Spector was able to offer a number of webinars on de-escalation, understanding use of force, and understanding law enforcement liability. Um, the last thing that I do want to mention is a law that I believe got signed in 2021. The time is really flying by, but on recreational marijuana. So a lot of questions got asked immediately afterwards. What are we going to do with recreational marijuana and now that it's legal in Connecticut? So we addressed that topic specifically with all of the risk management advisory committees that we have. We started with the law enforcement advisory committee. And what the question really that we asked is, what do you as law enforcement uh, executives, so we have chiefs, lieutenants, captains on that committee, what do you need to know about this bill that uh, will assist you in hiring, in retention of officers, in uh, understanding what your current policies are? So what we did is we actually partnered again with Rose Kaler LLP, who I mentioned earlier about the EPL uh, helpline. We partnered with them and we took a subset of the Law Enforcement Advisory Committee and we created a task force. That task force asked a bunch of questions of questions of what we needed to know. And Rose Kaler took that back and created a frequently asked questions document, which we just in this past week published for our law enforcement members. It's not completely exhaustive. I think as uh, the bill moves forward, as time moves on and we start seeing more claims perhaps come in about uh, that may reference uh, recreational marijuana, we will probably continue to update that document but we wanted to get something out uh, immediately. And uh, really we wanted to focus on law enforcement because it has probably the most implications on police officers and law enforcement. For some of those other departments such as general government, public schools, uh, not a lot has changed. We still probably have policies that say you cannot be impaired when you're at work and in the workplace. For public works individuals who have to carry CDLs, Marijuana is still federally illegal and you cannot have marijuana in your system if you wanna have a CDL license. So nothing changes for public works, nothing changes for general government, nothing really changed on the school side, but we saw the biggest impact was on law enforcement. So we provided that document and now we're doing that same process with our fire services task force to understand what questions they're asking for fire services as well as ambulance services and we're anticipating having another document specific to that. So we are looking at uh, recreational marijuana, we are looking at police accountability, and we're continuing to offer resources, services, products that can better educate our members to understand risk and manage it. 
I talked a lot. I apologize for the lighting in, in here. I promise I'm not in a dungeon or in an interrogation room. I, you're, everyone's home offices are so much better than mine. I'm jealous. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have from a risk standpoint or maybe some things that you're seeing and would like some additional information on. Yes, sir. Uh, Frank. Yep. Yes. So uh, I'm also on the Veterans Commission. And at this past month's meeting, we had Chief Medina, our new Chief of Police, speak to us at the Veterans Commission, along with two of his lieutenants, people that he brought over from Hartford. I will tell you flat out, it was terrific. Uh, with respect to police accountability, he is totally ramped up. I mean, it is the theme of the New future weather still police department. And uh, I would uh, suggest that you all are uh, agreeable to invite him to a future uh, insurance committee meeting. And, and he is really is transparent. He wants to meet as many of the town committees and uh, as he can to introduce his new platform. So uh, I'm not sure how we actually execute that, Mike. It might be through you, but uh, would. Uh, uh, our former representatives uh, and uh, the committee members like to uh, hear Chief Medina, and we can arrange it. Frank, Frank, move your phone. I think your phone might be too close to your speaker. We got to move it a little closer to pick up your voice, Frank, but just keep it away from your computer speakers. You're muted. How much of that did you hear? <laughs> oh, we oh. could hear everything. Okay. Uh, talking about Chief Medina uh, speaking at a future meeting. Not even heads? Yes, okay. Yeah, we'll we'll let you keep that for us uh, in the next couple of months. So Frank, yeah, I'll, make, Oops, I'll make arrangements to invite the chief. I think that's great. Thank thank you. Uh, is there any other questions or comments um, from a risk standpoint? Karma question. If not, thank you for uh, inviting me today. It was great seeing everybody. It's going to feel so great when we're all finally in the same room at the same time and all of this is over, but I will be there then. Uh, thank you all. You missed it, Ian. I had the privilege of actually seeing everyone in person in November. Wow. Thanks for yeah. the It was good. It was good. All right, so unless, like Ian said, there are any other questions, I guess we'll flip it back to either Chairperson Cena for the next agenda item or, or Chris. I don't know how it works. The official. Think no, thank, thank you very much. Um, and uh, for, for Chairman Cena, uh, Frank, um, we're still in technically item number two, so I'll just do a continuation there. Um, in terms of just USI update, property casualty and risk management activities. Uh, as we've often said, risk, or as I've said, risk management never sleeps. Every single week. Yeah, Alex is laughing because he knows too. It affects those loss ratios for sure. Um, you know, one of our clients actually had burst sprinkler pipes on Martin Luther King Day while we had the day off. So I was working that day too. But just to give you an idea of some of the things that take place in between these meetings. And, and there's always a list. Um, what's interesting and timely is that just yesterday, we had an annual claim review session. And uh, one of the benefits of a virtual environment is we can have more people come together. And ironically, Pat Litke of Kerma, who anchors the workers' compensation uh, claim handling, who works with Claudia very closely and Matt, Cynthia Mancini, a liability claims manager, Ashley was on. We had um, Sherry Adams, who is a leader on the liability side and has a lot of experience connecting over to the law enforcement liability side. Um, myself, two people from my office. Uh, we, had, we had a bunch of people. It was definitely Hollywood Squares. But the more important thing was the 
Why were we doing it? And what's the benefit to the town and the school district? Why we were doing it, and we've talked about this in past years, is share information about the status of large or complex open claims, whether they be liability, whether they be workers' compensation. Because these are kind of like living, breathing claims, there's always a change that takes place. Sometimes Kerma may know something the town or school district won't or vice versa. But the sharing of information allows for refining strategy. It lets us take a look at those claim reserves and say, okay, is this a situation where there might be adverse development where there's a need to increase a reserve or like what happened yesterday, there was actually a claim that was able to close out um, there was a better outcome with a with a reduction in the reserve that was on the loss runs from a, from a month ago. So a lot of good collaboration going on there. And the whole idea is to get positive development and closure with these open claims. So that was a big one. And, and it's just coincidental that we have a number of people uh, that were on yesterday's call that are on this insurance committee session too. Another one is just ongoing consultation. I can think within literally the last week and a half, um, I was working with Mike and the town on one matter that related to some public works activities alongside a roadway uh, that required, uh, you know, kind of an, a, a need to answer the question, what should we be thinking about? What could possibly go wrong? And what do we need to do going forward? And I won't tell you exactly what it was, but it was, had to do with some property adjacent to a roadway that the town owns. There was another matter that related to a resident who had some damage uh, on the resident's property. And again, I won't go into the details, but we're always trying to further those things along. So those are some, some areas that get important. Um, one of the things that I initiated some discussions with Mike on just this past week, uh, and we'll talk more maybe at next meeting, is USI, our team services. Um, our contract is going to be coming up and we have some ideas that are very positive for the town and the school district that'll help protect your budget in terms of our, our own you know, fee structure, but also maintain or actually expand the services that we provide. And this is based on you know, ranking some of the services we provide that similar clients feel is very, very important to them. So more to follow on that one. And then uh, I would say probably the last couple items. One is budget. Uh, Mike is getting himself deep into not only his uh, insurance and risk management budget, but overall. And um, you know, we work together with Ashley and Kerma to try to you know, obtain what they feel the, the projected rate change may be. But even more broadly than that, we think about cost of risk. You know, what's the average spend with the deductibles, you know, uh, with claims? And we look at premiums, we look at, at exposure change and things like that. So a lot going on there as well. Um, but at any point, if anybody has questions or wants to know a little bit more about these, these types of things, we'll do it. But uh, any questions before I turn it back over to Chairman Cena and then move things over to the agenda with medical? Okay, Chairman Cena. Uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, Happy New Year. Um, if you would just indulge me for one second, I'm gonna put something up on the screen. But as I'm doing that, I just wanted to give you a little feel for what I'd like to talk about tonight. Um, three things, uh, two of which were on the original agenda, and then one becomes a little bit of me um, calling an audible, I guess. Um, what I want to talk about relative to what was on the agenda is want to provide everybody with a brief update on where we are year to date um, when it comes to the budget that was set for last July and how everything is rolling up to that budget uh, based upon the first six months of our plan year. Um, I then want to spend more time getting into the renewal forecast um, that we have recently developed. Um, we're still probably, you know, a couple weeks away from getting the Cigna and Anthem renewal uh, estimates. 
But uh, one of the things we like to do is put that stake in the ground early and try to lay out um, if we were to renew today, how would those numbers uh, manifest themselves for July 1? So I want to spend a little bit of time on that. And that's what I put up on the screen. And then the last thing is I want to talk a little bit about a mandate that went into effect on Saturday of all days. And it had to do with uh, COVID tests that are sourced uh, over the counter and how uh, those tests will now start to flow into our benefit plan. Um, it is a federal mandate, so obviously um, we're going to adhere to it, and uh, the conversation will center as much on how the mandate come, came into play, but uh, you know more so on the operational aspects of uh, how carriers are gearing up for something that was literally announced on the 12th and was expected to go into effect on the 15th. So I'll we'll spend a little bit of time talking about that. Um, in terms of where we are year to date, um, I did distribute the report a couple days back. Um, you know, we're in pretty good shape as far as activity through December. Um, we're sitting on, you know, a good size surplus at the midpoint in our plan year. Um, I think the thing that gives me a little bit of pause is we're starting to see claims come online um, more so in November, December than we saw in earlier months. Um, kind of stands to reason. Um, in July, we were starting our relationship with Cigna. Um, they were getting their claim and eligibility system, system um, onboarded, ready to go. Um, it's not uncommon for a carrier um, when first starting out to hold claims for a month. Um, they'll want to test their claim paying system. They'll want to make sure that um, as a claim comes in, um, they'll want to make sure it flows properly once they're comfortable that they have cleared all of those checks and balances, then they'll release claims. So when you look at the first few months, the combination of your typical claim lags coupled with some of those pent up claims um, did result in more claims coming through in later months. Um, I think the same thing would apply to our Anthem relationship. Um, as we've discussed in prior meetings, um, there were a lot of problems with Anthem's conversion to a new claim system. Um, they were also holding claims. And, uh, and I think what you're seeing is a little bit of catch up where uh, we've seen you know, greater activity in November, December than we had seen in, in July, August, September, October. So again, we're still in a surplus position. Uh, but I do think, um, you know, I'll be curious as to how things come through in, in January and February, and that obviously is going to impact ultimately what we do from a budget standpoint in July. So again, wanted to make some brief comments on plan year to date. Um, let me pause and open things up to questions you might have uh, based upon what I had previously, previously distributed or my comments tonight. Okay. Um, if there's no questions on the claim report, um, let me start talking or diving into kind of where we are on uh, the renewal estimate for July. Um, folks, I apologize in advance. There's a lot of data crammed uh, into this spreadsheet. Um, this kind of captures all the moving pieces. Um, in years past, it was not as busy. And, I, and, and let me explain why. Um, in years past, um, we were a very simple setup. Um, we had all of our coverages consolidated under the auspices of Blue Cross, um, whether it was the medical, the pharmacy, the dental, um, whether it was on our active population or on our over 65 group, um, everything was all handled by Blue Cross. Um, that was then, this is now. Um, what do we have in place today? Well, we still have our Anthem relationship um, for two components. We have Anthem still in place on the dental. Um, we also have Anthem still in place on our 
uh, over 65 Medicare supplemental enrollees. Um, we do have new players on the medical for actives in the form of Cigna. And then we also have obviously the new pharmacy provider uh, Express Scripts. So in pulling the renewal together, we're pulling claim experience from a number of different data sources. Um, we've got to get not only our dental and over 65 claims from Blue Cross, we also may have to make sure we're pulling in uh, the runouts from the Blue Cross plan that was previously offered to our active employees. Um, coupled with that, we obviously need to make sure we have our new claim and curls through Cigna and Express Script. So we took a very simple claim projection and now we're expanding it out to capture all of these additional players. Um, the goal is pretty straightforward, folks, and it's a goal that we followed um, each and every year um, we've done the renewal. Um, in a perfect environment, you want to start with the most recent 12 months worth of claims. Um, you want to look at those claims, how they project themselves, and then you want to make any necessary adjustments. Um, you're going to adjust for in four shifts. Um, we've done that on this spreadsheet. We went from about 550 people down to about 515. Um, the drop-off is due to the fact that we migrated the active police off the plan. Um, we'll want to adjust for that in-force drop. Um, we also recognize that we have an arrangement in place through our captive stop-loss provider where all claims in excess of $150,000 are the liability of the stop-loss provider with Weathersfield only funding up to the first 150. Well, you wanna take all those claims that are at or over 150,000, and you wanna account for the fact that our liability is capped at 150. So what we do is we isolate all our large claims, we take those gross amounts, pull them out of our claim base. When we trend forward, then we add them back in. The point I'm trying to drive to is this, projection tries to harness what we've historically done. What it also tries to do is make all the requisite adjustments when it comes to um, the claim buildup. Uh, ultimately, at the end of the day, when you look at where we sit today, um, first pass, we're looking at around a 13% increase in our estimated claim liability. Um, and Chris, um, yep. Oh, I, I, I'm looking at this chart, and I just I, I'm I'm a little confused with the um, not really. I don't know if it's a table at the bottom. I understand the top piece and and how you've broken that up. I'm assuming I do that. You know, I mean, we're going from um, December to December 21, um, and you've broken it out by Cigna and Anthem. But the bottom piece, I'm not sure where those, I, I mean, there, are there headings that are missing off there or something for each one of those? Now, what are you particularly referring to, Tom? So if I go down to um, line 24, okay? okay, and there's a COVID paid claims and there's 8 million, okay? Oh, I see. Is that a um, is that an aggregate of Cigna and Anthem claims? Yep. yep, that's what I did. So what what I did, Tom, is for twenty four, which is gross paid claims on the medical side, that eight point two million yep. is a combination of Cigna and Anthem Medical. Um, the two point three million is a combination of Anthem Pharmacy and the new pharmacy claims through Express Scripts, and then the dental, because it's all under Anthem Speaks for itself. So I'm just simply taking those segregated claim amounts and then just rolling them up under as an aggregate claim total. Okay. The other thing that kind of that sticks, and maybe I'm missing some, is that we have roughly 200 more people enrolled in the, um, where is it? Um, 
In the dental, I'm assuming that's from dental. Correct. So um, uh, that 712 yeah. is a combination of around, again, the 520 active employees who have dental. And then there's 170 over 65 retirees. When you roll those two together, that's the 712. Okay. On the medical, on the medical, when it comes to um, our medical relationship, whether it's Cigna or Anthem, we have 529 active medical enrollees. Now, the over 65s are in that, but they're Medicare is primary, so their claims are very small. So historically, when it comes to developing our per employee per month claim estimates, we don't, we, we kind of just spread it across the 524 actives and not include the uh, 170 over 65 retirees in the development of that per capita. Now, the 529 includes the police and everybody else. I mean, it's, it's aggregated. Yeah, the, the, the police are not in there. Um, because the police are off, they're on the state partnership plan. The police are not in that. You know, 529 is the average of the 12 months. And then I build in the ending in force of 516, but the police are not in there because they're okay. not on the medical plan, but they are on the dental plan. Okay. Okay, so when we go out for renewals or when we look at a renewal, we're not including the police in our renewal numbers. No, I'll, I'll have to, yeah, I'll, I'll work, the police move to the partnership plan on August 1st. I'll have to work directly with the state on, uh, on what those rates are. Okay. So there will be, in essence, to your point, kind of a supplemental adjustment to this budget when it comes to factor in the impact on the police and what they'll be asked to pay at renewal. Okay, thank you. But the goal here, folks, is to try to make sure we don't leave anything off the table. We want to make sure from an underwriting standpoint, we're sound in our logic in order to come up with, hey, what do we think the number will be? Um, you know, we're still six months away from, you know, actually renewing it. Uh, the hope is if claims stay steady, then we'll be able to drop our trend and the 13% will come down. Again, assuming there's no dramatic blow up in claims, but at this point, I wanted to be conservative in my estimates, and I wanted to make sure that we weren't overly aggressive in how we're forecasting claims for the new plan year. Right? But from a claim standpoint, we're looking at around 13%. Um, although claims are the biggest piece of the overall pie, um, we do have obviously- oh, Before you, I'm sorry. I notice you're going to get ready to click. Yep. Before you go, can you explain the difference between the, the gross paid claims and the projected claims? Yep. So the difference between those two is the gross paid claims, that $11 million number, those are the claims from that 12 month look back. So when we look at January through December, um, we paid a little bit less than $11 million. Okay. When you then jump down to the 12.1, um, in essence, Tom, that's really medical trend that's driving that. That's, you know, making, again, some adjustments for enrollment drop, making some adjustments for what's going on from a large claim standpoint. But the real driver in going from 11 to $12 million is pretty much an assumption that medical trend being what it is, the average cost of services that drove 11 million costs will go up, utilization will go up, and that increase will drive a million dollar additional cost obligation for the town. Um, said another way, hey, an MRI today is going to be more expensive, you know, 12, 15, 18 months from now. A trip to a doctor's office is going to be more expensive than it is now. Picking up a pharmacy prescription is going to be more expensive 
And you account for that in line 30, which is the trend adjustment that we've made, um, whether it's for the medical pharmacy or the de dental. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Hey, um, Chris. Yep. Is that being driven, um, at least in part, by just general inflation in the economy? Yeah. It's, it's you know, th three things really drive that trend number. One is just the simple increase in the cost of goods and services. Um, the other one is an assumption that in an older workforce, you're going to see more utilization. So as that a workforce ages, you're going to simply have a situation where um, people go more. Um, those are really the two main drivers. Um, the other thing that you factor in is our benefits are all bargained. There is a concept called leveraging. So if I have a $4,000 deductible per my contract, the most I'm going to pay is $4,000. But if the average cost to cover a Weathersfield member is you know, ten grand, and I'm paying four of it, but there's 10% medical trend, well, guess what? The average cost just went from ten grand to eleven grand. i am paying $4,000. That $1,000 increase solely falls on the shoulders of Weathersfield. That's in that 8% medical, that 12% pharmacy. So it's really the combination of those three things, Mike, that drive you know, the trend assumption that these carriers use on their book of business. Um, one final thing on that, remember folks, we're self-insured. So we do have some liberties in terms of how we set the budget. Um, I know over the last eight or nine years, we don't trend at eight, 12, and 5%. When you look at what we trend at on average, we trend at about 6%. Now, some years we might be 11, some years we might be four, some years we might be 12, some years we might be six. But over the last eight year period, we generally average a 6% increase in our per capita cost year after year. So if the town ever said, if we needed to get aggressive, well, that's one of the areas you get, you adjust. So maybe we don't build in eight, 12 and five. Maybe we build in, you know, 10% across the board or 9% across the board or whatever it is to kind of be more in line with our historical. That's one of the things we've done that in the past. And that becomes a discussion point as we start to kind of lock down this budget. There's also what we call our fixed cost. And, and this is in essence kind of what we pay these various players to administer the plan. And what we try to do here, folks, and I won't kind of go into all of the detail, but what we try to do is segregate it by what are we paying in administrative fees? Um, what are we paying in stop loss charges? What do we think we're gonna get back in the form of pharmacy rebates? Um, did we get any administrative fee credits last year that would be sunset in the new year? So what we're trying to do is kind of harness all of those moving pieces to come up with where do we think we'll fall from a fixed cost standpoint. And I think what we're going to find is we'll still probably net out to maybe a forty dollars or $50,000 increase in the fixed cost piece. Um, we're going to see, and again, I assume the 10% increase in our stop loss rates, you know, we're going to see a sunsetting on a fee credit that Cigna passed along in the first year, but we're also going to see an increase in our rebate share. When you meld it all together, it is a cost to the town. So what you want to do is take stock in that and make sure you build that in as well. But uh, I want to be sensitive to questions you might have before I move on. Anything on my comments or my exhibit around fixed cost? And the total cost summary is where we tie it all together, where we're in essence looking at, all right, what do we have budgeted based upon our current enrollment for 2021? And then how does that roll up to kind of what we expect 
for the upcoming plan year. And again, we're looking at around a, a melded increase of 12%. So, you know, my counsel to the town and the board at this point is um, if you have to put a number down, 12%, I believe, is the appropriate starting point in terms of, you know, where we think we're going from a liability standpoint. Um, you know, the fixed cost piece isn't our challenge. You know, that's changing by 40, 50 grand on a, a, a $11, 12000000 million line item. It's really that million dollar increase in claims, which is what we need to account for. The last comment I'll make on this is, as we get more claim experience, um, then obviously I update this. Um, I'll take the renewal information again from Cigna, from Anthem, and kind of blend that in. But again, this is simply our starting point, um, recognizing that as additional information emerges, then you know obviously we, we blend that additional information um, into this calculation as we get closer and closer to uh, that point in time where we, we really have to lock down the budget. Any questions folks before I touch upon that mandate that I mentioned on the front end of our conversation? Um, on January 12th, um, President Biden announced a mandate that uh, pertains to over-the-counter COVID test kits. And the mandate um, articulated that uh, all uh, carriers and all plan administrators um, would be obligated to cover those test kits at 100% starting on Saturday, January 15th. So carriers had you know, three days to try to scramble to get things in motion, if you will. It's still a work in progress, but here is kind of where we are when you look at the guidance from uh, the federal government. Um, all individuals are eligible for up to eight test kits a month. Um, family of four, that's 32 kits. Um, family of five, that's 40 kits. You know, it's simply, you know, take the number of members you have in your family and each individual is eligible for up to uh, eight kits a month. The question becomes, what's the mechanism in which a member would get those kits? When you look at the guidance from the federal government, um, the federal government alludes to two ways in which a member could source those kits. The first is they can get it on what is called a direct basis. And what they mean by that is Paul Mead could walk into CVS, pull out his uh, Express Scripts uh, ID card and say, I'm covered by the town of Wethersfield. I just picked up these over-the-counter scripts. Here's my ID card. Paul pays nothing because they're covered at 100% if sourced on a direct basis. Paul shows his ID card. Um, that gets sent over to Express Scripts. They process that claim and they bill the town of Wethersfield. Um, as you can imagine, no carrier is a, has been able to get that in place in three days time. 
Now, all the carriers are saying is, hey, we're working with our current network pharmacies to get it set up. Um, we think we're still maybe a week away, but that direct basis will ultimately present itself, I would say, in the next week or two. And it's going to be very easy for the member. Show your ID card, get those test strip, uh, those over-the-counter tests. You pay nothing and you're out the door. Um, well, what happens if that takes longer to get up and running? Or what happens if I, I have the ability to get a over-the-counter kit today? Well, you can get it in what they call a non-direct basis. I can get it from Amazon. I can get it from Costco. I can get it from anywhere that sells a kit. Well, the way it's going to work in that environment is I'm going to pay for it. And then I'm going to fill out a claim form and I'm going to send it into um, Express Scripts. Here's the couple of things the member needs to understand. Um, we're only going to reimburse, or we, the plan will only reimburse up to $12 per kit. So if it costs me 10 bucks, no issue, I'll get 10 bucks back. Cost me 12 bucks, no issue, I'll get 12 bucks back. Cost me $20, I'm only getting 12 bucks back. So the government has created a mechanism where, hey, you get it through your pharmacy provider, through that pharmacy network, you pay nothing. Recognizing that these kits are in short supply and people will grab them when available, um, that's fine, but there's a limit to what a plan is expected to reimburse. We'll only reimburse up to 12 bucks. So that's kind of what has emerged literally since Saturday. And we're still trying to piece it all together. Um, as more details present themselves, we'll kind of share that and get it out to members. But that's kind of what we know, <coughs> excuse me, at this point in terms of this recent mandate. Definitely a little bit of a scramble. And from what I gather, oh, let me, one final thing. <clears throat> there is a third place where you can get them. If you were to go right now to um, www.covidtests.gov, the federal government is distributing kits. So I went in two days ago, put in my name, put in my address. It comes up at zero cost, hit the button, and I get a confirmation that it went through and I got a tracking number from the post office, I'll get four kits. I can't get 30, can't get 40, can't, I'll get four kits. You'll get four kits. But that's another way in which um, an individual can get their hands on kits um, is you can source them directly from the federal government. But again, there's a limit on the number of kits. I don't believe I'm gonna be able to go back next month and get another four. I think it might be at least at this point, a, a one-shot deal on what I can get from the government. Everything else, again, I'll get through my health insurer um, based upon what I shared with you. Ashley, I think you're on mute. Yes, thank you. That's four kits per household, not four kits per person. So what Chris was saying about every individual is eligible for eight tests a month, you only get four kits for free. And again, that's just per month. But the important thing to keep in mind about that is that these kits have shelf lives, um, which I think it's, it's good that they are being limited to some degree because you don't want people hoarding they're not being used now. And then by the time you need it, the kit may no longer have any efficacy. So just something to keep in mind from your friendly chemist. Yeah. And from what I gather, these kits are hard to come by, right? Um, you know, people say that, uh, you know, they were readily available two months ago, but it's a little bit of a different animal right now as far as trying to get your hands on them. You can still get toilet paper, though. So. It's, it's Pack, a, package stores are still open. <laughs> hey, Chris, this is more of a personal question than, a, than a, as it pertains to the panel, but this, how, does, how does that work with the high deductible 
plan? Are you playing on your own? Or? Yeah, great, great question. Great question. So the, 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 the one thing that you, you will have to communicate is, hey, if I get it through that direct basis, no impact. I'm not paying anything. I'm showing my ID card. I get it for free. <clears throat> but if I get it from that non-direct basis and I pay for it, you know, we're going to have to say to people, you can't be using your HSA monies to pay for that. Because the only way you can use your HSA monies if you decide not to seek reimbursement, because the IRS is going to take a dim view of somebody who uses pre-tax money to source an expense that they're ultimately getting reimbursed on. Okay. So they're not going to let you, you know, get the benefit of that uh, using your pre-tax money to pay that 12 bucks if you're going to get 12 bucks back. So. Um, you know, the government is not expecting these. It's considered almost a preventative service, Paul. So it right. doesn't go against the deductible. It doesn't violate any of the rules on expenses first having to go against the deductible. It's really about don't be using your card. Now, the reality is the only way people are going to get found out is if they get audited. But we, and I don't say that, I would never say that publicly, but we would have to say to people, you can't use your HSA money in a non-direct sourcing of those uh, those test kits. Got it. Yeah. And of course, shipping at the end of the month through the U.S. Postal Service. <laughs> that is correct. And, and, you know, here's another thing that came up is, you know, people were saying $12. Where did they come up with $12? I have no clue. No clue, because people are like, I got a test kit, it cost me 25 or it cost me 18 or it cost me 15. You know, what's the deal with the 12 bucks? No clue whatsoever. You know, have no idea how they settled on 12 bucks, um, but that's the number that uh, the federal government is deemed to be a, reason, a reasonable reimbursement amount for somebody who goes out and gets a test kit. Well, perhaps go on the... Uh... The Weathersfield Free Test Kit Facebook group. I'm sure there is one. Well, they, they sold out what in a day, right? Didn't they? They were gone in a day, weren't they? Yeah. I believe so. Chris, I wonder if they came up with a $12 for a single use kit versus the ones that are 20 to 30 are using the double test kit. Yeah. Just a thought. I yeah, I bet you that. Or, you know, did they kind of look at, hey, what's the cost of a test kit in Iowa and New York? And let's kind of blend and come up with an average cost. I have no idea. But um, somebody said, well, is there any recourse? Said, recourse. You know, now when the government says you're getting 12 bucks, you're getting 12 bucks. <laughs> but um, that's it, folks, on my end. Hey, Frank, I had to mute your phone because when you stepped away, we were getting feedback. Just I, so on your phone, just tap star six and we'll pick your voice up again and be able to hear you. Are you still on your call? Yep. You're still muted. Star six. Either that or hang up and, and dial back into the number. That omnipotent tool to be able to mute people can be a lot of fun. <laughs> I hear Frank talking, but I see him talking. <laughs> Frank, you got a pad and a piece of uh, and a pencil? Um, 
Frank, can can you hear us right now, Frank? Um, Mike asked if you could hang up your phone and dial back in and reestablish the connection. That might open up your uh, phone line. All right, Alex, you're officially still at the office way too late when that happens. <laughs> <laughs> Don't take Alex's dinner. <laughs> I, I thought it was one of the best backgrounds that I had seen in a while. <laughs> so you nice haven't had to do here. the the light wave. I've seen Mike have to trigger his light back on a couple of times. I try to keep moving. <laughs> I thought it was a background video continuous loop like the Born Supremacy or something like that. <laughs> Now I, I am watching some of the lights turn off down uh, down the way though, so I'm, I'm I'm willing to bet that they're they're coming for me soon. So if I go dark, <laughs> you'll know why. <laughs> We've got your back. At this at this point, are we just waiting for Frank to be able to sign on, and we can try well, it in? Seems, yeah, I, I believe so. I don't. There, there's no other business I'm aware of, Paul. Who's the vice chairman? I think you are. Oh. Here we go. And hear me. I can hear you. What did I say about the new normal? What did I say? I'll pay $1,000 to anybody who comes to my house and helps me fix this. Frank, we can hear you though. Okay. Yeah, I apologize. I have no idea what the problem is. I don't even know how to fix it. Wait, let me get my baseball bat. <laughs> Did I just hear you mouth right. the words were adjourned? I didn't hear that. Move to adjourn. No, not yet. One of the business. One of the business, uh, I'm looking for a vice chair just in case I maybe get pharyngitis. Who would like to volunteer to be vice chair? I'm looking at you right now. Uh, I'll volunteer, Frank. Okay. I was, was going to take over the meeting anyway, so, so I'll volunteer. Okay. Well, only only to be able to close out meetings, though. Done. <laughs> Call for adjournment. Move to adjourn. Uh, second. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 We're done. All right. Have a good night, everybody. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Good to see Take you. Care, Have a good night, everyone.